It's a great pleasure to be here in Romania today. Uh, love being back here. I was uh, last at Death Camp in uh, 2015. Had a wonderful time. So it was all excited for you to come back if I got invited. So today's talk, we're going to focus on uh, layer two protocols that I see uh, in uh, consulting engagements that are being often missed by the network auditors, the penetration testers, uh, vulnerability assessments. And I consider it like being the low-hanging fruit uh, during uh, security assessments that are just being totally overlooked because everyone's focused on the higher layers of uh, networking. And so when I talk about layer two, I'm talking about layer two in the OSI model. It, I, I want to encourage you, if you're, out, if you're involved in doing the security assessments, to don't overlook those lower layers of the OSI stack. Many of my peers, and your peers, are focused on those higher layers, you know, all, all the cool stuff is that, you know, in the web apps, the mobile apps, and that all needs to be looked at. But there's a whole lot happening at those lower layers of the OSI model that are being totally ignored. For, if, for example, what inspired this uh, presentation when I was uh, working in consulting, I came in behind a penetration test team, and uh, the whole test had been done, every, all the things had been hacked. I mean, from web servers, ILT, sensors, it, if it had an IP address, it had been hacked. And I came in just to uh, see what had happened on the test, opened the laptop, and in less time than it took me to boot the laptop, I, I found any high-level vulnerabilities that would have been totally missed, just opening up Wireshark. And so that's what this inspired this talk, is, uh, too, is uh, too much is being missed at the lower layers of the stack here by some of these network protocols, and I want to call some attention to it. Because it's not, a lot of it's not being covered in the certification courses that are out there today. Uh, so here's an example. I'm an old school network engineer, about over 20 years experience uh, in routing and switching, service providers, telcos, enterprise, other uh, interesting networks. And so as an old school Cisco guy, one of the protocols that we'll use out, especially if you're doing consulting, is CDP, the Cisco Discovery Protocol, to go in and map out a customer network, or if it's a non-Cisco non network, we use LDP, LDP to uh, map out the network to see uh, what the neighbors are, who's connected to who, what, you know, whether we're connected to a router, to a switch, to a phone, how are we connected, what interfaces, and be able to map out the customer network. Because whatever drawings they give us, we know we're going to be wrong, right? And so we'll use this to go map it out. But from a security professional standpoint, as a security professional, if you're just going and pull, pull up Wireshark and you start seeing this on the wire, you're going out and doing a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test, or maybe you're working on a red team, and you're trying to come up with some new vectors to get into the network that weren't expected. This is, a, this is some low-hanging fruit here. You can uh, very quickly start finding out, if you're on like San Francisco network, what versions of hardware they have on the network. It's before you even start scanning and maybe triggering an IDS if they even have one that they're even looking at. Uh, you can start seeing what versions of code are on the routers, the switches, what, what's going on with their phones, what VLANs they might be using, and start developing an attack path totally passively to, say, go after the network infrastructure. Uh, now this is a, if you get into enterprise networks or any kind of network that's uh, any size, you won't want to see it's in the uh, small networks. But in your medium, large enterprise, uh, service provider, telco networks where uh, redundancy and reliability are an issue, you're typically going to see multiple routers in place that, so that if one router fails, a secondary router will automatically pick up and the routers are going to be sitting in a heartbeat between each other. And you, they might, you could pick your vendor, it could be Brocade, Juniper, Cisco, whatever your favorite Kool Aid is. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a hardcore Cisco guy. But, it, but this, this architecture is very fundamental for whatever your vendor tastes for. Uh, and so you're, you're going to have uh, these two routers, primary and secondary, and they're going to be sitting in a heartbeat between each other. And in my consulting experience, over 20 years in the business, I have never seen when there's redundant when there's this redundant architecture in place. I've never seen that these networks have been secured. That that first talk protocol, whether if it's a Cisco network, is the uh, HSRP the hot standard <coughs> protocol, or if it's uh, if you're an 
anything but Cisco House, like uh, doing Jeerberg, Brocade, uh, what have you, whatever your Kool-Aid is for network infrastructure. Uh, uh, those protocols to authenticate those routers to do that handshake to that heartbeat, I, it's almost never secure unless somebody has come in and, uh, and uh, exploited it before I've got there. Or they, and so, so this is a, a, always a, a low-hanging piece of fruit on the network that you will always find if you go into an enterprise where they have this redundancy. And what you can do is you can fire up a uh, router on your laptop. You could use, a, say, GNS3. You could download GNS3 that will fire up a, a virtual router on your, on your uh, laptop. Or you could go and use a tool like Colossal Packet Builder so that you can import in. Uh, a PCAP that you captured of uh, HSRP traffic or VRP traffic and fire it out on the wire and look just like a Juniper, a Cisco, a Brocade router and make these other routers stand down and you take over as a router for the network and you can then start doing a man in the middle attack against all the outbound traffic. Now, now the key thing I will tell you is if you were to go do this attack is that I've uh, taught this a lot of places and some people will go in and start doing it. Well, key thing to remember is to you, when, you, when you turn this on your local host, you got to turn on default routing. You got to turn on routing on your uh, attack system to forward the traffic. Otherwise, you're going to black hole all the traffic for that local land and then you're going to buy that help desk and you know, you're going to get busted. So you got to make sure that that, that uh, attacking system is going to have routing turned on. So here's an example of what you're going to see in your PCAP. If you're, not, if you're not used to looking at PCAP, this is uh, an example of some uh, VRP code. It's real simple, it's just the out of the wire. If you're not looking at this stuff out of your pen test engagements, you need to be looking at this because it's out there and it's being missed. So in this example, we take uh, VRP and we can see that there's no authentication. Nine times out of ten, you're going to see no authentication. If you see authentication, whether it's on a Juniper network, Cisco network, Brocade network, the password is probably going to be Cisco, Juniper, Brocade, San Fran, uh, or it'll say uh, the name of the company, organization. It'll always be something real simple, even if they do a password, but you, but you never see it encrypted. And here's an example of where they uh, put in a password here and they just have the vendor, put, just stick in the vendor name. And this makes it very, very simple for us. Like I said, most, most likely, if they have this redundant architecture, they're not going to have a password at all. And if they do, it'll be clear text. Now, here's an example where I mentioned using that Colossal Packet Builder. This, in this example, we're not using the VRP. We're taking a uh, PCAP capture of HSRP. This is, say, a Cisco network. And what you see up here in the red and the red black, we have uh, two routers that are sending uh, a heartbeat between each other dot one and dot two are sending uh, a heartbeat between each other with HSRP and they have a clear text password of Cisco that they're authenticating each other with and the attacking system has got an IP address of dot 50 and what you can do is you can take your Wireshark PCAP and you can import it into this Colossal uh, tool called a, a Packet Builder and you take that raw wire chart, pull it in, and you can go in and edit and change fields. And so what we can do is we can take one of the one of the uh, packet captures for say the dot one router or the dot two router up here, and we can go in and change it, change the IP address, the, the host octet to dot fifty, and then we can go in and change the priority because there's a priority of who's going to be the primary router, who's going to be the secondary, as we showed in that first initial slide. Well. We can go and look up the RFCs for how the protocol works, and we can see, like in HSRP, in the Cisco documentation on the web, that the highest priority is 255. What you're going to typically see is the priorities are going to be something like 90 and 100, 100, and 105, something like that. Well, we can go in and grab 255, the highest, and set up the preempt, and go in and rebuild the checksum on the packet and just start resetting it on the wire. And now our Windows box. Uh, is all of a sudden now sending packets out on the wire and it looks like a router. And those routers will submit to that packet and you're just, And so now all those routers will stand down and now all of the traffic for the local network will come to you 
is you can do a man in the middle attack and capture all the outbound traffic. You won't get the inbound traffic coming into the VLAN, but you'll catch all the outbound traffic. Now this is where, this again, I'll, I'll remind you, the key, key thing here is, is if you're going to do this attack, because this will work, you've got to remember to turn on routing on the attack host. Turn on the IP forwarding on the uh, local host that you're going to do the attack from. Otherwise, you'll uh, drop all the traffic in the bit bucket and you'll light up the help desk and you'll get busted. You don't want to get busted, especially if you're in a red team Just If you do a denial of service during a pen test, you know, whatever, all bets are on. So here's the, here's the example I was talking to you where you got your 1.1 and 1.2, and we go in and we start editing, and we change the priority, and we can go in and uh, change the checksum. So we've reported it here in this code soft packet builder, and we've taken that 1.1 and 1.2 router, and, and we've just taken uh, and changed one of those packets to dot fifty our attacking system here, and just rebuild that checksum, and just start firing it on the wire. It's very, very simple. It, now another way to do this, if you got, if you're, uh, if you're into Linux and Python, uh, uh, another way to do this would be with like scat. You could, you know, if you're into scripting, you might, you might want to go and try to do this with scat. It work great, but I like doing this with Windows just to show that you can do it with Windows if you're Windows impaired. <laughs> you can, uh, you don't have, to, you don't have to be a Linux guru to do something like this. All you need is the Wireshark and the Microsoft Packet Builder to pull off this attack. Also, another protocol, it's always real funny to go in and do uh, audits and you ask people when you're running D6 and they always argue, no, we're not doing D6 until you go and capture bar chart around the, the network, the different segments, and you find there's all kinds of D6 on the network. It's everywhere whether uh, the network admin realize they're running D6 or not, they've got D6 most likely turned on on the network by default, maybe it's the Internet of Things, devices, and sensors. Uh, facilities people might have plugged into the network. Uh, maybe it's a, a Mac or Windows box that's been turned, it's got V6 enabled by default. But V6 is going to be out there on the net. And this is a, this is a good backdoor, especially for the red team to go in and exploit the network. And what can you do with it? Why? How are you going to attack it if you're not familiar with V6? There's some really good tools out there that make, your, make it uh, really easy to attack the network. The first vulnerability that's out there is with the V6. The routers are going to automatically advertise the IP address for the gateway out on the network in that local VLAN, and they're sending those router advertisements. And it's real easy for a host that's sitting out there listening. If you got a, uh, a pen tester or a red team out there on your network, it's real easy to to go uh, and see those router advertisements if you got a V6 host out there, and then. And take, take a tool like Chiron. Chiron is a really good tool I would recommend you uh, taking a look at from the guys from ERNW over in Germany. Or you can look at uh, Evil Polka, or like I said, you can go and use Scabby and uh, Ride Your Own to go in and uh, send these IPv6 router advertisements out on the network and spoof the router. Make yourself look like an IPv6 router on the network. Just set yourself up a man in the middle attack. And similarly, you're, similarly, now with the uh, V6, if you're not again, if you're not real familiar with V6, we don't have uh, the uh, ARP problems that we had with IPv4. We don't do ARP poisoning anymore because IPv6 doesn't do uh, broadcast; it does multicast. We have unicast, we have multicast, we have what's called anycast, where you basically you're having with anycast you have duplicate IP addresses across like a big you know across the internet. But we don't have broadcast with IPv6, we do multicast. So you lose the ARP closure, you lose your editor cap, you lose your king enable. But we still could use Chiron, the Evil Boca, the TAC Parasite, or like I said, you know, your own tool with uh, scripted with scatting to go and attack the network discovery protocol on the wire so that you can go and uh, spoof traffic and you conduct the, the same old school uh, man and mill attacks we've been doing for over 20 years now. Like I said, those are totally being missed, what I've discovered out doing consulting. Now, this is one of my favorites. Multicast, especially with the whole Internet of Things taking off with all the sensors, with all the cameras and all the sensor technologies that are being rolled out in uh, really large networks and uh, the public infrastructure. Uh, 
multicast can be turned on these networks so that these sensors, uh, the cameras, can uh, multicast and send their traffic streams uh, across the network. And the network engineers, a lot of the network engineers are not proficient in multicast and or, or the security teams real proficient in multicast. So this is some low hanging fruit to go after in a lot of these networks that you may be out there testing and trying to help secure. So what happens with the, with the multicast, you're not familiar with, you have your host on the local network. It could be cameras, it could be sensors, it could be uh, some other endpoint device. And they're going to send IGMP requests in layer two up to a router to join a traffic stream. They're going to be sending an IGMP request. They could be IGMP version one, two, or three that you might see on the wire. Sending requests up to the router to say, hey, I want to join this multicast stream. Send me all that information. And then on your routers, what's happening with routers? Routers are going to be running uh, protocols like routing protocols for multicast that are going to be based on the that's going to build on top of the routing protocol running on the network, say OSPF, et cetera. And so the PIM is dependent on your OSPF, your EIG, your RP, or your static routes, depending on what you're using, to build out its network table of what is the best path to traverse to the network to get to deliver traffic from the source to the destination. Um, and like I said, in addition to the Internet of Things, uh, I built, I spent a lot of time building telcos and uh, service providers, cable companies. You know, they're when, and then, uh, I'm sure they're doing this over here in Europe. We did a lot in the U.S. for over 10 years. Uh, when you're clicking your TV channel and a lot of the new modern networks, it's actually when you're changing TV channels, you're actually changing IP multicast groups in many cases, because uh, that's what that's what your service providers are going to do. So multicast is, is going nuts. It's growing like crazy. So if you're going out there and you're doing the auditing, you're out there on the network and you're looking for vulnerabilities, what you're going to see is IG, like I said, you'll see IGMP out there most likely. You might see IGMP version one, version two, version three, depending on what they have configured on the network. And you might see it from the routing standpoint, if they have multicast turned on on the routing, then you're going to see the PIM protocol. And it might be, uh, PIM version 1, PIM version 2, and, and when you start seeing those protocols out there like that, they should, they should trigger you. I want you to start thinking, you need to go and start doing some serious Googling and read some RFCs, the tech docs on whatever vendor's network they are, because there's probably some vulnerabilities in the configuration that they've overlooked, because because there's no reason inside those VLANs for you to be seen for our users to be, those endpoint devices to be seen in those routing protocols. Because, you know, why does the Windows box need to see routing protocols when it's not a brocade or Juniper or Cisco router? It shouldn't. And if and you can get in the head of that network engineer and you can start reverse engineering how they've been trained and what certifications they, they have, and you might be able to go in and take, take over their network once you understand uh, the mistakes that they've made. Because if they've made mistakes here, they've made, made mistakes with like SDP, uh, they might be using Telnet instead of SSH, things of that nature. So how we're going to attack uh, the multicast? Again, we could go to our tools like uh, SCADME and Codesoft Packet Builder, and maybe we, uh, I mentioned with the IGMP, the IGMP is going to tell the routers, hey, we want to join this multicast stream, but maybe we could uh, go and craft IGMP traffic and tell the routers we want to join multicast streams that really shouldn't be getting dropped into a segment of the network. But maybe we got some, we've done some recon, we got some intel, if we know the multicast groups are being used and we can start crafting uh, IGMP traffic to get the router to start dropping uh, streaming video to us or some other information that wasn't intended. It may be uh, we, can, we can send enough requests and pull enough traffic down and we get a uh, call to denial of service. Depends on what the goal of the, uh, of the adversary is. And similarly, on the, from the routing standpoint, we can also go in and uh, expand the network and make the multicast network look larger than what it is and maybe introduce our own PIM traffic and neighbor up with those routers and tell them, say, the Brocade, the Juniper, the Cisco router, what have you, that, hey, we're also a multicast router and expand the footprint and topology of that router and maybe introduce uh, new multicast sources so that there's traffic streams out on that multicast network well, maybe if we can go and join the uh, multicast routing 
we could make the uh, network reconverge and source our own traffic and stream traffic that uh, introduces errors into the network. Uh, maybe we could stream our own inter interesting video, depending on the application. You can limit it by your creativity and rules of engagement. Uh, now, how you might, and one way you might uh, do that is you could like you could use tools like uh, the G GNS3, GS3 uh, to fire up a router or uh, run Quagga on your Linux box. And if you want to substantiate a very large network in a VM, you might look uh, at a uh, Naval Research Lab. It's got a tool called Core, C-R-E, that you can get, get down, download uh, for free that'll build out a really large Quagga network uh, right there in a VM so that you can throw off the internal network operations team if they start trying to troubleshoot the network, you build out a really large network just inside a VM. You have multiple users. You can use IP addresses of uh, inter let's just say interesting organizations to build out the network that you're using to attack attack the multicast network that they're trying to troubleshoot. So how would you uh, how do you secure the multicast? Well, one thing you got to do is you got to start putting on those routers. We got to start locking down. And on the switches as well, locking down those trust relationships. There's no reason, say, inside our VLANs, again, that those endpoint devices, those Internet of Things, the sensors, the cameras, a end user's Windows box or their Mac should be be able to interact with the router with those control plane protocols. So we need to lock that down, and we need to lock down those switches as well, because with the multicast. We're using UDP, which is fire and forget. You know, the UDP, we're just fire and forget. There's no two-way handshake. So there's not, we need to lock down the layer two as well to keep somebody from spooking traffic. Something else uh, is the OSPF. OSPF is, uh, if, you're, if you're doing the, the Juniper, the Brocade, or the Cisco, you're probably going to run it. If it's a, a network of uh, more than a couple routers, you're probably going to start seeing the OSPF protocol. And this is a low hanging fruit for you guys on the red team. And what you can do is, again, you can take and uh, use the Quagga, use the, the G GSN3, whatever, or Loki, to introduce the OSPF packets into the network and expand that network. And maybe you inject new routes or a new spoof network and uh, redirect traffic to your system so that you can do a man in the middle attack against the routing. This is typically vulnerable. If they're running OSPF, it is typically vulnerable. This is what you're going to look like with no authentication. And, the, and typically, if you see authentication, again, it's going to, everybody is consistent. The network guys are going to use whatever they used in their class during their certification program. Cisco, Juniper, Brocade, whatever the name of their company is, organization, that will be their password, clear text. And very rarely do you see a password on it. But if you do, you'll see where it's like, say, in the bottom. You can crack that. Uh, you might also, if you're in a pure Cisco network, you'll see the EHRP, which is proprietary. And EHRP, is, if you're new to routing, this is a really good protocol to learn. It's really easy to get up and work. But similar to the OSPF, you can go and fire up a router on your VM, say the GSN3, go and get you, if you don't have router code, go out on eBay and buy you an old router. Get you some router code off the router and uh, fire it up in GSN3, or go get Cisco Pearl. The IRL and fire up a router and join the network and start introducing routes into the network and get traffic reintroduced to and uh, redirected through you. Just make sure that you have routing turned on on that local host correctly so that you don't DOS the network. And it's, if, it's in, if it's a production network, you're testing it. And that's what's going to look like with your packets when you're into the network, what it will look like uh, with no authentication. This is what you'll see. Uh, and with the uh, GRP, you're either going to get clear, you either get uh, no authentication or you get MD5. You don't get clear text as an option. Here's another problem from the layer two side we see is with these DMZs, when we're out doing pen testing in the consulting realm, if we could ever get a handhold inside of the VLAN, these DMZs, you can move laterally at will through these networks. We need to go and make sure that inside these DMZs, that we're locking down those trust relationships so that if someone infiltrates those DMZs, that infrastructure, that they just can't pivot at will. Like, for example, we got into a really large, I've seen this in a large healthcare organization and, uh, and, a, and another interesting organization where they had uh, 
uh, unit systems run at NIS integrated with Active Directory on Windows from the DMZ to the internal network. And once we were able to pop the uh, Unix box in the DMZ because they had that, that NIS integrate, services integrated with AD, once we got the passwords, we had everything for the inside and, and the outside because it was all just one uh, directory. You need to pay close attention to that. So if you want to use stuff like uh, private VLANs, VLAN access control list, and lock down that layer too. Because if you've got a big network that's built out and you can't change it, you got to live with that IP address structure for whatever reason. But you can still go in and, and lock, lock down your trust relationships with layer two. But then put some visibility to monitoring. If you have, what we typically see is if there's monitoring on the network and network flow traffic is being looked at, it's typically being looked at up at the north end and the perimeter of the network. And I highly suggest that you get visibility, get the flow data, get your S flow, your net flow, whatever kind of flow capability you have on the network. Get it all the way down into those VLANs and understand what's happening inside those VLANs with the uh, lateral traffic communication to see how your adversaries may be trying to fit it in the network instead of waiting for them to send traffic northbound watch for their traffic going east-west in the network by getting visibility at layer two and, uh, and monitoring and have a baseline of what you expect to happen. If, if devices should not, certain devices should not be communicating, why did they certainly, why did they suddenly start? If you have a baseline and you know what, what you expect because you got a traffic maintenance built into your monitoring, you should get a, you should be able to get triggered when uh, devices start communicating that should not be. And another thing I'd recommend is my, my specialty on when I went on the on the red teams, on the pen test team is I went after the network infrastructure. Highly recommend when you are putting in this monitoring capability, because this is what I'm going after. I'm going after your monitor because I know if I can get in that we'll take everything over. No matter how much money you spend on blinky lights, if we can get into that we'll take everything over. Go and put in network caps. And network caps will help you get around organizational politics about who controls the routers and switches, because as a router guy, we don't want anybody, including security, in our routers and switches. We don't want anybody in. We own the routers and switches, stay out of our network. And the way to get out of that politics is to put in network caps. That way it's just an electrical bump in the wire and, and go out of band and build a whole separate uh, out of band network to monitor your network. So here's some references. You can go back and look at a lot of books and papers that I recommend. And, uh, and if you would like the slides, if you will contact me, I will uh, send you all the slides, especially I've ever done, all my presentations, uh, including these, if you're interested. Uh, you hit me on Twitter, you hit me on LinkedIn, and, uh, and as, soon as, I, uh, as soon as I get home, I will uh, send them to you if you would like.